the Whitehead Institute and a professor of biology at MIT. Well, uh, I, I too would like to uh, thank Cell Signaling Technology, uh, Michael Kuhn, Roberto Polakievich, and the gang at CST for supporting this. Uh, we at MIT are very grateful for that. Uh, you may all be very pleased to be in this uh, room, but my feelings are much more nuanced because for four years of my life, I ate three meals a day, six days a week, the wretched food in here, and I vowed never after 1964 to come back into this room, and now I've been sucked back in uh, with the memories of how badly I was uh, fed then. Um, Michael, uh, expresses the faith that the new genomics is going to get us uh, into all the insights into cancer. But I have a quite different uh, point of view because I believe that there's two mechanisms of epigenetic signaling that turn out to be extremely influential in the biology of a, an advanced tumor cell. The first is the differentiation program of the normal cell of origin, which I believe perpetuates itself. Don't try to read this. This is a PowerPoint uh, failure. Uh, the, uh, the first is the uh, differentiation program of the normal cell of origin, which perpetuates itself robustly in the derived cancer cells and obviously is of epigenetic nature. And the second, which I will talk about today, are the contextual signals that cancer cells receive within the context of a tumor, which to my mind, as I will try to argue today, represent very important determinants of the behavior of individual cells. Uh, that said, um, I, what I would have shown you here, I'll show you here in, a, in, in less dramatic fashion, and that is that if one looks at, at carcinoma cells, in this case um, implanted, uh, these are human breast cancer cells, implanted in and growing as a xenograft in a mouse, one sees here the surrounding mouse stroma, one sees this tongue of carcinoma cells which are expressing an epithelial marker, and here one sees a rim of carcinoma cells of human origin that have shut down the epithelial marker cytokeratin quite distinctly, and instead here in another tongue have turned on the mesenchymal marker vimentin. And, and this indicates that in fact cells that are in direct opposition to the recruited stroma have undergone a profound uh, cell biological change called the epithelial to mesenchymal transition, which as I will argue has uh, important effects on the biology of the cells, as I'll indicate momentarily. Indeed. Uh, the EMT program, the epithelial mesenchymal transition program, is a multifaceted program involving a whole series of cell biological traits, many of which, as you can see here, are critically important to understanding the biological attributes of high-grade high carcinoma cells. The EMT program is choreographed by a whole series of EMT-inducing transcription factors, EMTTFs, they're often uh, abbreviated, and here one sees their expression in the embryogenesis of a whole series of metazo and phyla. These uh, transcription factors are highly uh, conserved evolutionarily, and virtually all of them are present in all higher metazoa, indicating their ancient origin. I even found snail, one of these, in the sea anemone, which is an extremely primitive metazoan. So these go back very far, maybe 550 million years. This is the image I wanted to show you before, and here you can see how, uh, in fact, um, going from the epithelial to the mesenchymal state seems to involve preferentially the cells on the outside of, of, of an island of carcinoma cells. And implicit in what I'm saying is the fact that cancer cells, like those here, are making opportunistic use of a, an embryogenic program, the EMT, which here you see, for example, is involved in the uh, gastrulation of a Drosophila embryo. Switching gears uh, ever so gracefully and, and rapidly, I, I just mentioned the work of Michael Clark, 2004, in which he used fax analyses to s fractionate populations of breast cancer cells into majority populations, minority populations. As few as 200 of these cells could form a tumor upon implantation in a mouse. As many as 20,000 of these failed to do so. And this indicates that the cells within a tumor exist in alternative phenotypic states with, in this case, very different biological properties in terms of their tumor initiating capability. One has rationalized this uh, by appropriating the scheme that has been used to in indicate the organization, the hierarchical organization of normal epithelial tissues, where the cell at the apex is a self-renewing stem cell, but in this case considered a tumor initiating cell or a cancer stem cell, whereas the bulk of the cells within the tumor have undergone a measure of differentiation and have lost this self-renewal attribute. And this scheme has also been appropriated to try to rationalize metastasis. 
because if this cell were to leave the primary tumor uh, and land in a distant tissue, it's qualified to seed a new metastasis on the basis of its tumor-initiating capability. Conversely, the bulk of the cells of the tumor, even if they were to traverse the, the voyage in, in, through the bloodstream and land in a distant tissue, would not be so qualified because they lack this tumor-initiating capability, just to bring this into a clinical oncology practice. Uh, uh, about four years ago, Sender Raimani and Wen Chung Guo undertook to pose the question whether the EMT program, which I described to you first, and the stem cell program, which I then described to you, are connected, a, a, a notion which I thought at the time was quite bizarre. But sure enough, here when they separated these uh, um, immortalized human mammary epithelial cells into majority non-stem cell population and minority stem cell population, and they forced the non-stem cells to pass through an EMT through the forced expression of either the snail or the twist, EMT-inducing transcription factor, there was an en masse migration from the cells in the majority non-stem cell position into the stem cell position. Of course, this was accompanied by the morphological change one associates with the EMT, moving from a cobblestone to a more fibroblastic morphology. This already suggested some intimate interconnection between the EMT program and the stem cell program. And indeed, if one took these two populations of cells as they did, separated them, and used RT-PCR to quantify the um, expression per cell of different messenger RNAs in the putative stem cell and the non-stem cell population, they found that the putative stem cells expressed one two hundredth as much of the keystone epithelial marker, e cadherin and between uh, five and 120-fold as much of a whole series of mesenchymal markers, including in this case four EMT-inducing transcription factors, indicating that these cells naturally express a whole series of transcription factors that have been associated from other work with the EMT program. Another uh, demonstration of this association came from the work of Wen Jun Guo, who um, took advantage of the fact that the stem cell program in the normal mouse mammary gland is very similar to the stem cell program that operates in derived carcinoma cells. And so he asked the question, if you took normal mouse mammary epithelial cells, forced them through transient expression to go through an EMT, if he then implanted these cells into a cleared mammary stromal fat pad, could he drive those cells to, for to form an entire um, mammary ductal tree, which was a rigorous definition of normal stemness. Uh, indeed, the, in the work of Jane Visvader, he fractionated these cells, which she claimed were uh, stem cells, and indeed they were, upon implantation into a cleared mammary stromal fat pad. The majority population failed to form um, these, this mammary ductal tree. The majority population was cobblestone in morphology. The minority population was uh, fibroblastoid. And indeed, the cells from this uh, demonstrated stem cell compartment expressed, in this case, a 36-fold higher representation of the slug, EMT-inducing transcription factor, which can be visualized here in the abluminal sites in this cross-section of a mouse mammary duct. This already indicates that at least one component of the EMT program is operative in a normal, um, uh, non-pathological tissue. Uh, that having been said, uh, when uh, Wen Junho took a population of uh, mouse mammary epithelial cells, forced them transiently to express two EMT-associated transcription factors, slug and SOX9, as few as 100 of these cells formed uh, a uh, mammary uh, ductal tree upon implantation into a cleared mammary stromal fat pad whereas 10,000 of the cells that had not experienced that exposure failed to do so, indicating at least a hundredfold increase in the stemness in the gland repopulating activity of, um, of these mammary epithelial cells. So this begins to solidify our, our, our confidence that there's an intimate interconnection, for reasons we cannot uh, divine, between the stem cell program and the EMT program. In his case, for example, one could use this to uh, plot out the hierarchy of changes that occur during differentiation in the mammary gland where, as it turns out, differentiated luminal cells that are fully differentiated can be pushed into the stem cell state th through the transient, and I uh, emphasize transient expression, of these two transcription factors, slug and SOX9. And other progenitors express naturally one or the other of these two transcription factors. This could be leveraged in turn to ask the question whether these transcription factors actually have an effect on cell biology. Here's the behavior of these uh, human breast cancer cells growing as xenografts in mice. After 12 weeks in a mouse, they form a primary tumor with a smooth edge. However, after the, if, the, if they're exposed, if these cells are allowed to form a primary tumor and exposed for two weeks to the two transcription factors that I mentioned before, now if one wait, and then they sh one shuts them down, now if one waits uh, 10 weeks later, they continue to remember that exposure and form these highly invasive margins, indicating that somehow the uh, aggressive phenotype perpetuated itself in these cells. And perhaps of greater interest is their metastasis forming ability from uh, implantation in an orthotopic site. 
Thus, normally these cells form neither macroscopic nor uh, microscopic metastases, but if one, for example, exposes them transiently for two weeks to these two transcription factors and then shuts them down, now one gets 400 micrometastases per lung and almost 100 macroscopic metastases per lung, which begins to um, impress on us the possibility that if one looks at the powers of the EMT program, as I just illustrated, and one associates it with the last stages of malignant progression, it becomes now plausible that cells in a primary carcinoma that uh, have acquired a whole series of mutations, somatic mutations, are actually poised to disseminate if they can activate their EMT program, disseminating without the need for acquiring extra somatic mutations beyond those that were selected during primary tumor formation. This is a suggestion of that, but hardly a rigorous demonstration at, at this point. I would just mention this paper, which I find uh, particularly dramatic, which emphasizes the importance of uh, these cancer stem cells, here using not a cell surface marker, but the enzyme aldehyde dehydrogenase. If one looks after a neoadjuvant therapy at the lymph nodes of women, women who had um, uh, aldehyde positive and therefore cancer stem cell positive cells in their lymph nodes after chemotherapy, uh, the misspelling isn't mine, they had this kind of uh, survival, whereas uh, women who had uh, carcinoma cells in their lymph node that lacked these cancer stem cells had this kind of survival <clears throat> in the months forming an initial clinical presentation. So here one begins to see that these are more than just innocent bystanders in the, um, in the pathogenesis of cancer cells. Uh, we were interested, uh, particularly Christina Shale, in the, the question of how cancer cells maintain themselves perhaps metastably in either the mesenchymal or the epithelial state. And here I'm, I'm giving you a whole um, a, a series of signaling uh, uh, descriptions, which is, after all, the theme of today's uh, uh, talk, uh, talks. And, and here I, I just, uh, she made the hypothesis that autocrine signaling is really very important for cells to maintain themselves in either the epithelial or mesenchymal state. When she compared the conditioned media of cells that had been um, grown um, uh, for an, uh, an extended period of time, either epithelial or mesenchymal cells, she found that the mesenchymal cells uh, lost Wnt inhibitors, acquired expression of a uh, non-canonical Wnt protein that they secreted into the medium around them, lost expression of bone morphogenic protein, which is a uh, TGF-beta antagonist, and, ex and in showed increased expression of these two proteins, which are involved in regulating TGF-beta signaling flux. And just to go into detail there, for example, if one compares uh, epithelial cells here with their mesenchymal counterparts, the mesenchymal cells experience a, a six or eight-fold decrease in this Wnt antagonist, in this in the case of these mesenchymal cells, or in this case, an almost thousand-fold decrease in the case of these spontaneously arising mesenchymal cells, this being, as I said, a Wnt antagonist. Here's another Wnt antagonist, DKOPF, DKK1. I often, I take some pride of ownership here because, as I often mention, my mother always called me a dickup, so I find uh, not entirely flattering. Here's the epithelial expression of dickup, the wind protein, and here one sees that this, pro this protein is also secreted at much lower levels um, in, in cells that have become mesenchymal from an epithelial state. Moreover, one can find a non-canonical uh, uh, wind signaling to be increased when cells in the last two channels have undergone an, an EMT. Here one sees up upregulation of expression of this non-canonical wind, upregulation of phospho-PKC, uh, upregulation of phospho-C-Jun, and general evidence that non-canonical wind signaling is similarly increased uh, as evidenced in the extracellular space, the soluble secreted proteins. Here we move over to the TGF-beta pathway. BMPs are known to be uh, antagonists of TGF-beta signaling, and as she found, a whole series of BMPs, there's a whole flock of them, go down anywhere from five-fold to almost a thousand-fold when cells go from an, EMP, uh, from an epithelial uh, to a, um, a mesenchymal state, indicating that these antagonists of, of the EMT, uh, of TGF-beta signaling, decrease significantly. And in, importantly and interestingly, the antagonists, uh, BMPs are antagonists of TGF-beta, but the antagonists, uh, but the antagonists, excuse me, the antagonists of the BMPs themselves um, uh, actually go up, as you can see here, between the 30-fold and, uh, and 100-fold in these mesenchymal cells, or here um, be between 8-fold and, 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 uh, uh, and perhaps 5-fold. So the, the enemies of an enemy are, is a friend. These things help to sustain the uh, TGF-beta signaling, and 
uh, TGF beta secretion is, is upregulated a bit modestly. Uh, phosphosmad is upregulated a bit when cells go through an EMT. And importantly, if one takes cells that are driven through an EMT, uh, either by the expression of this EMT inducing transcription factor or spontaneously so, and one interrupts their extracellular signaling loops, then one sees a, a strong collapse in their mammosphere forming a a potential, which is a surrogate assay for stemness, either uh, through adding a recombinant SFRP, Wnt antagonist, or BMP4, the TGF beta antagonist, to their surrounding medium. Um, so these cells, even though they're continuing to express this EMT transcription factor, continue to depend on these extracellular signaling, autocrine signaling loops, in order to maintain their, uh, their residence in this state. Uh, this is even uh, true uh, in, in terms of, um, let's say, the, the motility of RAS transformed cells, where if one blocks both their um, Wnt and TGF beta signaling, one sees here uh, as much as a 20 to 30 fold decrease in their motility because these cells are deprived of these extracellular signaling loops. Uh, and these interventions in interrupting uh, the signaling loops have uh, no effect on um, cell uh, proliferation in, in monolayers, so they're not really cytostatic. So this leads to the following model, um, which may actually be correct, and that is in the mesenchymal state, the perpetuation in the mesenchymal or stem cell state by many of these cells depends on their ability to secrete at least three, there's some more, uh, signaling factors, TGF beta, canonical winds and non-canonical winds, and if these, if these extracellular signal loops are interrupted, then we can find situations where these cells lapse back into the epithelial state. So they're more than just interesting uh, ornaments on, on this state. Conversely, the epithelial cells, uh, they continue to produce TGF beta, but the TGF beta is ambushed by BMPs, which actually interfere with TGF beta signaling intracellularly. The canonical wind signaling is, is uh, ambushed, and here it is in the extracellular space, by my compatriot DKK1, Dickhoff, and SFRP1. And non-canonical winds are hardly made at all. So these two cells can maintain themselves metastably in one state or the other through these extracellular signaling loops, which, by the way, are not depicted in the intracellular circuit diagram that Mike Yaffe showed you before. And this is obviously just scratching the surface in terms of trying to understand how cellular phenotype is maintained through non-intracellular signaling uh, circuits. Um, she also extended this to, to demonstrate that the same um, circuits that are used in an autocrine fashion to maintain residence in the mesenchymal slash stem cell state are also used to provoke cells to move from the epithelial to the mesenchymal state. And here, to make a long story short, she found that the addition of five uh, components, including shutting down SFRP1 and DCOP, anti and anti adcadherin e antibody, uh, blocking TGF beta signaling, or adding TGF beta and adding a non canonical wind, led to the induction of uh, these two critical. EMT inducing transcription factors, um, and, um, and perhaps here one can see it even more dramatically, where these induction cocktails seen here lead to a, a dramatic increase in the mesenchymal and cadherin, a slight increase in wnt 4 uh, a great increase in phosphorylated PKC, which plays an important rate role in the, um, in the mesenchymal state, and also in, in SMAD2 signaling, as you can see here, and in fact, uh, very strong increases in the expression of these two uh, ENT-inducing transcription factors, which persist after the induction cocktail is removed. That is to say, these cells now uh, stabilize themselves in the resulting mesenchymal slash stem cell state. Here you can see the increases in stemness and motility long after these cells are no longer exposed to this uh, multi-component uh, cocktail. By the way, to state the obvious, this indicates that the activation of the EMT program is not achieved by a single heterotypic signaling protein, but rather, in general, this is being only one example of it, uh, it uh, results from the convergence of a number of uh, incoming signals on, on carcinoma cells. And so uh, it turns out that these signals initi may be initiated uh, either from the uh, stroma or from other sources, largely from the stroma, but once a cell is pushed into the mesenchymal state, these signals which provoke entrance into this state may then serve in an autocrine fashion to maintain it. We don't really understand the, the complex uh, transitions that occur between these two states. Here are some other kinds of heterotypic signaling, that is signaling between dissimilar cell types, just to show you that this only scratches the surface of the complexity. I don't revel in this complexity, to be honest. I wish it were much simpler, but we have to confront which with what nature has, uh, has handed us. Here's a class of cancer cells, uh, lobo colorectal carcinoma cells, and like many carcinoma cells, these cells secrete uh, IL-1 beta, 
And that impinges on mesenchymal stem cells, MSCs, that are recruited into the tumor-associated stroma. And when one commingles these cells in vitro, one sees a profound upregulation of, for example, prostaglandin E2 uh, by more than a factor of 100, and the release subsequently of uh, grow alpha, IL-6, IL-8, and, 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 and RANTES. And therefore, when these two cells are permitted to interact with one another, as must occur within uh, naturally arising carcinomas, where MSCs are recruited in large numbers into the stroma, there's a profound upregulation in the expression of these uh, proteins, which play important roles in cell biology. To make a long story short, what um, Ann Lee found is that interleukin-secreting carcinoma cells interact with the IL-1 receptor on the surface of a stromal mesenchymal stem cell. These, uh, this, that cell responds by upregulating by two orders of magnitude its production of prostaglandin E2, which then acts in an autocon fashion on the MSC and in a paracon fashion on the nearby carcinoma cell. The autocon action on the MSC results in a secondary wave of release of grow alpha IL-8, IL-6, and if one assembles the entire scheme together, one sees that this results ultimately in uh, the activation of a signaling pathway that actually activates beta-catenin signaling and activates the EMT program. So here is one scenario, and it's hardly the only one, by which epithelial stromal interactions can actually provoke uh, movement from an epithelial to a more mesenchymal stem cell state. And again, this is obviously different from what I showed you before and indicates uh, the complexity of these heterotypic signals and the, the multitude of distinct signals, incoming signals, that can induce uh, entrance into the stem cell state. Here's a, another piece of work from Hai Hui Lu, who found that cells that have already entered into the stem cell state are able to physically tether via a CD90 protein monocytes and macrophages so that they're now, these two cells are now closely opposed and can signal in this juxtacrine fashion via efferent efferent A receptors to send extracellular signals coursing into the stem cell which then reinforce the existing uh, stem cell state rather than triggering it anew. So here's a, another example of a cell which is present in large numbers in the uh, recruited stroma, which also influences uh, cancer cells, but in this case, not triggering entrance into the mesenchymal stem cell state, but simply reinforcing it through this kind of interaction. <clears throat> Wai uh, Yong Tam has been interested in trying to understand the intracellular signaling circuits to so, show some deference to what Mike Gaffey was talking about. And by the way, our our uh, conceptualization of how the EMT works is not simply a binary program being an either in the epithelial or the mesenchymal state, but a series of steps in which cells reside metastably. They can go backwards in this direction. Um, if one drives cells entirely through the EMT program into what we call the extreme EMT, they may reside stably in this mesenchymal state that is essentially indistinguishable, amusingly, from uh, a mesenchymal stem cell. But this may not be a physiological process. We just know we can accomplish it um, uh, experimentally. Uh, and he's been interested in, in trying to understand the, the signaling proteins that are involved in the epithelial versus the mesenchymal state. Um, he's found, among other things, uh, that uh, snail, twist, and slug, which are distinct EMT-inducing transcription factors, slug being more involved in stemness, by the way, they can induce a, a similar uh, transcriptional program, as you can see uh, from, from here, that if you look at the genes that they activate, there's a, a strong overlap indicating a common EMT program, um, and even overlapping peaks as, uh, uh, as elucidated by a chromosome immunoprecipitation. So he, here you see that uh, on these two promoters of these two genes, one sees that twist and snail and slug bind to uh, common sites on the DNA. And this begins to suggest multi-transcription factor complexes that converge on these sites in the, in, the, um, in the promoters to collaborate with one another to form um, these, uh, these, uh, these complex. Moreover, for example, on the twist promoter, one finds that twist itself, snail, and slug bind to the twist promoter, again on similar sites. On the snail promoter, uh, twist, snail, and slug can also be discerned to bind to the snail promoter. And on the slug uh, promoter, one sees that slug uh, and snail and twist also bind to its promoter indicating that these cells, these uh, transcription factors stimulate their own expression on the one hand and that they exist in multi-protein complexes. Here one sees in this um, sequential chip on chip that a snail um, binds to, uh, to a promoter, but if one now removes this complex and secondarily uh, immunoprecipitates it with twist, uh, 
antibody that now one brings down the same complex, indicating that the two transcription factors are physically complexed one to the other. So there are protein-protein interactions. And indeed, if one uh, uses a twist antibody, one can see by Western blotting here, the twist can immunoprecipitate both snail and slug, indicating once again multi-transcription factor complexes. This is a rudimentary scheme of what he's shown, which, by the way, is, is reminiscent of what happens in embryonal stem cells, where the four transcription factors maintain each other's um, expression. And, and by the way, uh, implicitly in what I'm showing you is the notion that there are multiple distinct layers of control that influence residence in either the epithelial or the mesenchymal state. I showed you before that extracellular autocrine signaling is critically important for that. Here I'm showing you that there's intranuclear signaling, which is also critically important to stabilize residents in the mesenchymal stem cell state through the actions of these transcription factors. And in fact, there are yet other extracellular autocrine signals, including, by the way, prostaglandin E2 and PDGF, which are secreted by uh, mesenchymal cells and also function in an autocrine fashion to stabilize residents in, in the state. Wiley Yong Tam has taken this work further and demonstrated in, that in these multi-protein complexes, the TGF beta um, components, the SMAD components, SMAD2 and SMAD3 and SMAD4, are critical components. And if he prevents these SMADs from uh, homing to these uh, sites of joint binding, then these, these complexes fall apart so that the binding by the SMADs is really a critical prerequisite to the final activation of a gene by these EMT-inducing transcription factors here one takes this uh, maybe uh, to the extreme because here he finds that, for example, on the, on the serpine one gene, there's a whole series of transcription factors that are found to be bound to common sites in, in, in the promoters of these genes, here including snails, uh, tw twist snails, slugs, M1, which are all um, EMT-inducing transcription factors, FRA1, a component of the AP1 complex, SMAD3, TGF beta signaling complex, STAT3, JAK STAT signaling, and even P300. So everybody is getting in on the act here, and this echoes work, for example, in Rick Young's lab, which shows that there are things like super enhancers, where there's lots of different transcription factors that move together um, and somehow collaborate, conspire with one another to turn on gene expression. Um, to, to make a, a, a long story short, um, he's found that, for example, Fra1, the cousin of FOSS, both of which participate in, in um, AP1 heterodimer transcription factor formation. FRA1 is turned on when cells go through an EMT, and, uh, and FRA1 <coughs> is activated directly on its promoter, <coughs> excuse me, by, these, by twist and snail transcription factors. And if one prevents FRA1 from being induced uh, during the course of the EMT, then uh, once again, one, one goes from a mesenchymal to an epithelial state, indicating its essentiality in the expression of the mesenchymal phenotype. So uh, just to make a, a long story short, uh, he's also found that, for example, mesenchymal cells have reduced EGF receptor signaling, compare, for example, here with over here, and that they have increased PDGF receptor signaling, compare here with over here. So that there's a rewiring of the receptors that are present on the cell surface, um, and this confers on the mesenchymal cells greater sensitivity than the epithelial cells to an inhibitor of PDGF, and conversely, on the epithelial cells, it confers on them greater sensitivity to an inhibitor of EGF signaling. And so, uh, to summarize what he's done in, in, in recent months, he's found that these two states, the more epithelial non-cancer stem cells, rely on the EGF receptor and on this uh, version of, um, of the AP1 transcription factor complex, with CFOS playing a prominent role, not indicated here, by the way, are the SMADs and TGF beta, whereas in the stem cell mesenchymal state, in, in fact, now the entire wiring is, is reorganized. PDGF receptor moves into center stage. EGF receptor retreats. Now one begins to signal via uh, uh, the, uh, PKCs. In, indeed, uh, in, inhibition of this PKC blocks activation of the EMT program. Um, and now uh, one, one has a FRA1 rather than, than um, uh, FOSS playing a key role, as you can see down here, in the formation of this AP1 transcription factor, which then conspires with these EMT-inducing transcription factors to activate the EMT program. Uh, and this can be used, can be exploited, actually, to preferentially target mesenchymal rather than epithelial cells, uh, using, as, as Wailang Tum has found out, um, inhibitors, specific inhibitors of the, um, uh, of the mesenchymal cells, paclitaxel and starospondin, uh, in the, uh, inhibit the green epithelial cells here at a lower drug concentration than the mesenchymal cells, 
explaining the, the relative drug resistance of, of mesenchymal cells versus epithelial cells to these drugs, whereas conversely, these inhibitors of PKC affect preferentially in the red lines the mesenchymal cells requiring a higher drug concentration to affect the epithelial cells. So these differences in, in, um, in signaling sensitivity, in, in inhibition sensitivity, can be actually exploited in order to begin to develop drugs that preferentially hit the epithelial or the mesenchymal components. And this is of more than passing clinical interest because there's now widespread uh, interest in the fact that uh, mesenchymal cancer stem-like cells are more resistant to many conventional uh, chemotherapeutics as well as radiotherapy and may represent one of the sources of clinical resistance that developed after an initial response to uh, treatment. And on that note, uh, I think I finished a minute or two early in this place that I vowed never to come back into. Thank you for coming. Our second speaker.